maybe you could take us through some sort of a case history um, in outline, just to give an example of uh, your approach to a, a hip problem. Okay, so so you know normally we we have a, a system that most people probably have. We use clinical patients send a lot of information in. I might have some letters from from. Uh, from, from consultants that have referred, uh, that maybe they've had previous surgery, uh, maybe the, the surgery hasn't worked, and, and, and they've asked for an opinion. Uh, the patient comes in, I'll take a case history just like anyone was. I would, I would be thinking about various hypotheses in my head. For example, if it's an anterior hip pain that they're getting, is it because the pain's more provocative in deep seated positions? Is it more provocative when they're driving the car, with the right foot on the accelerator, lifting it backwards and forwards? Is it more provocative if they walk upstairs or walk uphill? What are those? What are those? What are those criteria leading you to? Let's say it's car pressing the accelerator. What are you immediately thinking then? I'm thinking. I'm thinking in my head. I'm thinking like a hip flexion uh, issue. I'm thinking: is there a, a, an underlying source tendinosis, tendinopathy? Uh, is there is there a, a source bursitis? Uh, is that a result of the surgery, where perhaps perhaps they've had some calm debridement uh, for the, the the impingement? And what we're left with is a source tendon, almost sandpaper itself against that, that roughened area. Okay, yes, it's maybe not rough, but it's an analogy I use to patients. Uh, yeah. And so, so that's the type of thing that I would be thinking in my head. And, and I'd want to test that hypothesis. So, so what you tend to find in, in individuals with that type of pathology, across the hip, pelvis and groin, if you take away uh, the ability for a tissue to function efficiently, then somewhere else has to draw uh, more activity, more load. That gets redistributed. So a classic example there, you would find, so for example, the obliques, uh, the tensor fascia lata, and the lateral quad, uh, vastus lateralis, will be really overactive. So they're trying to perform that hip flexion moment, okay, in the, at the expense of a weakened inflamed source. Uh, so, so of course, we want to test that hypothesis. So we could, we could do an Ober's test for tensor fascia lata to test to see how stiff that is. We know then, in that position, if that test positive, that perhaps uh, that individual may be also lacking lateral hip control. So they may have a loss of inner range posterior glute meat activity in that position. So that goes, tends to go hand in hand. We know from a range of movement uh, uh, capacity that they'll have lost flexion and they'll have lost internal rotation. Why that not may, may be a possible cause is, is think about the anatomical attachments of the tensor fascia lata. If it's overactive, it's going to pull us more into anterior pelvic tilt. It's also an internal rotator. So it's not that the hip has lost internal rotation. It's essentially being held in internal rotation because of an overactive muscle. So if we can take away some of that tension and retrain the, the hip to move more appropriately, okay, then maybe that source can start to function a little bit more efficiently and we can start to load that tendon appropriately. If we think as osteopaths higher up the kinetic chain, think about the thoracolumbar lumbar junction. Okay, of course, the innervation to the psoas we know is from L1 to L3. So anywhere around that thoracolumbar lumbar junction, we're going to find a restriction. We will because if you've Think about uh, what I talked about before, about the overactive obliques. Think about the anatomical attachments. We're going to get tender points, trigger points. That's going to affect respiratory motion in terms of inhalation, breathing, and it's going to affect how the, the thoracolumbar uh, region can, can move in terms of rotation aspect. 